With 46 years of experience in the ski industry, Chip Carey has held positions at many ski resorts across the country. He worked at Sugarloaf for more than 26 years in roles in sales, marketing, and public relations. He also took on the position of Vice President of Marketing and Sales for the Canyons Resort in Utah, enabling him to be part of the Salt Lake Olympics in 2002 when the NBC Today show broadcasted live from the Canyons for 14 consecutive days. For four years, he worked as Senior VP of Marketing for the American Ski Company across a network of eight resorts, using his wide range of skills to build brands and revenues. From his experience building Sugarloaf as a ski destination, despite the mountain's remote location, to the launching of new brands, Chip Carey has been involved in many aspects of ski resort operation. His experience made him a standout candidate for his most recent position as the chief marketing officer at the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. Throughout his career, Carey has placed an emphasis on staying up to date with technology and trends to best reach customers and customize experiences. And most importantly for me personally, he hired me in 1984 to work for him at Sugarloaf, and I had the distinct pleasure of learning from him on a daily basis through 1991 when he was instrumental in helping me launch Nancy Marshall Communications, and he was my client throughout the 1990s. Chip and I have had a lot of great times, and I think you're going to hear in our conversation today how we still have this chemistry of fun but serious pursuit of excellence in public relations and marketing. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. So Chip, to kick things off, tell us about your career and how you got into it in the first place. I went skiing. Got out of college and went skiing. That's my career. <laughs> and I just happened to be able to make a living doing it and a lot of various different things. But uh, photography is what got me into marketing and PR. And uh, it was a love that I like to do. And I was an amateur and I turned into a semi pro photography and that opened all the doors for me. So you were back at Sugarloaf. This was in the 70s. Yeah, 1971. 71. Yeah, and uh, I just came in as a, as a waiter and at the Sugarloaf Inn and uh, saw what was going on. I had done my some research and knew what Harry Baxter liked, and I went up to him to try to figure out how I could ski free. And I knew he'd like to have some PR. He liked PR a lot, so uh, I – and he didn't have a job for me. So I uh, I had hooked up with another friend who knew Harry, and he was an Eastern ski rider. And we decided we concocted a story and told Harry that last year when I was in North Conway, I used to send photos down to the Lynn Item newspaper and uh, of people up there on ski weeks from Lynn. And uh, this Bill Beaton guy said told Harry about me, and uh, Harry opened up the door, and when the opportunity came, I ended up in a job. Well, I mean, this is going to be such a hard conversation for me because there's so much. All right. So first of all, you just touched on hometown stories. And, you know, because I've learned so much about PR from you over the years, I know that, you know, the hometown newspapers always want to know stories of hometown people. So that was one of the things I learned from you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, back in those days, you looked at it, you know, how are you going to get your stuff in front of people? And we knew local people, local papers like to talk about local people. And so we 
used to send every time we had ski races, we'd do the same thing. We'd go out and we knew, knew where the people were from. We'd look in our little media guide, send photos there, and they, and they loved it. So we got a lot of, you know, we didn't score the Boston Globe all the time with those type of stories because they didn't want the little hometown stuff. But the, the, out in the, the smaller papers that don't exist anymore, uh, we used to get a lot of coverage. Right. And of course, in those days, there was no internet. So you were shooting photos with film and then developing them in the darkroom and then putting them in the mail. Oh, yeah. Put them in the mail <laughs> or it send sounds, them with runners. Yeah. Sounds absurd. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Runners. That was another thing is you had a whole network of runners that would deliver. And you were one of them sometimes. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> I can remember sometimes when you'd send me out on the road and I'm like, oh, this driving is really bad. And you're like, we are in the ski business. So yeah. we drive regardless <laughs> of conditions. Yeah. You know, it's, it, Snow always brought us a good opportunity to get something out into the into the papers and you know, on TV, and so we had to go if it was snowing. We had great photos, of, and that's what skiers love: snow. So you take pictures of snow, and the th- the thing is that um, skiing was being underrepresented in the state of Maine. Okay, at the time, in my opinion, at least from a PR side, and I always looked at skiing. Um, probably because of my back time as a very visual sport. And so, you know, I was a phot- still a photographer, but when I when I finally got the opportunity to get in one of the offices at Sugarloaf, I found a 16-millimeter camera. And that opened up television for me. And that was really awesome. Right. And then, so speaking of being a runner, then you figured out, and again, you taught me, like, how to get photos or video down to the Weather Channel. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. So- put it on airplanes and stuff like that. And but you know, if you think about it, I mean, it's all about building relationships. You know, it wasn't. It, it, you know, I didn't just start sending stuff. You know, um, sixteen millimeter film to the TV stations without going ahead and visit them and warning them that it was coming and open up relationships. And uh, uh, no, ma- no matter what you do, our business of marketing and PR it's all about communications and if you're not communicating with the people all the time on a regular basis you're not gonna you're not gonna build a relationship you're gonna need when you really want to have something done for you well I'm just I'm just smiling because people who are who've been listening to the PR Maven podcast will now know where all of this came from because the whole premise of this podcast is about building relationships and building your network both in person, which is, again, your strength, and also online, and that has become your strength also, so that you have to do it both ways. And also, don't just go meet somebody when you need something. And, you know, our friend Bill Green talks about the first time that Chip Carey walked into Channel 6. (laughs) Oh, I remember that day so well, Nancy. (laughs) Yeah, it was quite funny. What happened? Well, Well, he was just out of school. Right, and he was sitting at the desk there, all dressed up in a suit and tie. I remember he was just sitting there, young guy. I was young also, uh, and I walked in. At those days, I had a big bushy beard and I had long hair, and <laughs> he really didn't know what was coming at him. But we ended up striking up a pretty good relationship, and and you still have that relationship today. I still have the relationship today, and and when when and. And, and Bill's been a really solid one, but uh, there's a lot of them that, that I built. But, but the thing was, I always made sure I gave them what they wanted. And and you only know that by getting to know the people. And that's part of that communications. Okay, if you, if you, you, you can't send somebody X when all they're interested in, it is A. Okay, you need to know what they're interested in, what what they write about, or what they what they show on television, and what they display on the internet or wherever you know. And there, and it, once you know that, and you know your you 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 know those people, you can build a really solid relationship. And you know, you know, you talked about. Yeah, you know, can I just go yeah. to the, the D base three? Yeah, D base three plus <laughs> okay. the database. <laughs> the database, yeah. And you know, in those days, there was no such thing as Salesforce or any type of program like that. And as as, as we talked earlier, you, we had to build our own databases back in those days. And one of the things that really helped me, and and you know, and it was also those days when people thought it was a toy. You had that Radio Shack machine, you know, and things like that, and people were playing. 
Atari, you know, they were games. I thought that's what we wanted them for, so we played games. But in reality, you know, I could go in and, you know, a a writer, uh, a newscaster, or photographers, because I also did a lot of work with a lot of photographers, and anything I found out about them, I would come back and I'd put it in my database. Oh, I found out that the kid's name was Joe. Oh, I found out, and maybe, oh, you got to make sure you know their wife's name, you know, and if they had it, if they're really into animals, what's their pet name? So in this D-base, D we were always adjusting the, the, the fields, available fields, and so if I was going to call somebody, I could just flick on my little database tree and take five minutes for it to come up and, <laughs> and, and, and look and say, well, ahead of time, oh, oh you know, so-and-so, his wife's name's Josine or something, you know, and they love their dogs or cats. And once you do that, you start building good relationships with people. And you also had in there whether they were interested in cross country skiing or snowshoeing or Nordic or <laughs> yeah, yeah. golf, tennis, and yeah. all the different interests. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Was, I, I kind of left that out because I assumed that that would be known. But yeah, it was yeah, targeted. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah you'll yeah. be very targeted. But you know, what? in in life, you need to know. You know, they always say that it's always best to know your enemy. Okay, and so it's it, you. You really you need. When you come to marketing, if we get off of PR just a little bit, it's the same thing. You need to know your customer, right? And the more you know about your customer, the better you can communicate with them, especially in this day and age. Uh, you're wasting so much money if you, don't, if you don't know your customer and if you're not targeting very specifically to their interests. Um, and, 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 of course, the Internet has made that really much easier. And, uh, and we'll get in probably into the – into today a little bit later probably right. but we you know the old days was, it was a lot of work i think today is actually easier yeah it is although we are expected to do more because it is easier so it's uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's assumed that you mm -hmm. can do things a lot faster yeah but yeah when i think about uh, you know the mimeograph machine <laughs> to, gen to make copies of the press releases and then envelopes with stamps and the press kits that we would send out oh, 1600 yeah. press kits and and the smell of the of the smell of the uh, uh the, the fax machine oh, the, fa the fax machine oh, yeah. when they were burnt when the spin the thing was spinning around it'd take 10 minutes to scan one page <laughs> but that was great because all of a sudden we didn't have to sit on the phone and dictate a story about – we had a lot of races at Sugar Golf in those days. Well, we actually still have a lot now. But we'd call in the resorts, the results and and we'd give them a story. And we used to have to dictate it. And what a pain in the butt that was and time-consuming. And then we started, you know, figure oh, there's a fax machine? Right. <laughs> and uh, in some cases, I actually bought people fax machines. So they'd have them on the other end to save me time. Oh, wow. And also I remember – you used to hook up into the phone line <laughs> up on the slopes, and I think that was a little bit. Maybe we shouldn't talk about that, but that you started transmitting photos to the Associated Press. Yeah, I, I was fortunate again because I built some relationships. I mean, again, you're going to hear this over and over again. Uh, I built relationships with both AP, UPI, and probably the only PR guy in the whole United States that had an AP and a UPI machine in my office that I could send photos out anytime I wanted to. Right. Pat Wellenbach. Yeah. And Gene Woolman. Yeah. And UPI, yeah. yeah. And uh, the thing is, you know, they ended up getting a string of up in the Sugarloaf area. So if something happened up there, they'd call me up and I would go out and shoot it for them. And I wouldn't charge them. I would just go out and shoot it as you know, as a favor. And they always treated us pretty well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had that figured out too. Yeah, and yeah. then the other thing that it makes me think about is how you always said to tell the visual story. Make sure to make it visual. And that was the key for television, certainly, but also even in newspapers to get above the fold. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, photography background. So, you know, skiing, people want to see... I always kept saying, even in the early days of the web, you know, and if, if you read an article in the New York Times that we have on the Sugarloaf website, it, it, we're quoted as saying, you know, next year. So we're in, we're in 1994, right? We said, next year we're going to have video. 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, really streaming didn't really become fashionable until well into the 2000s, but we were we were always trying to push it. Yeah, well, Sugarloaf had the first website in the ski business, didn't it, in the cold country? Well, it was, yeah, first full HTML um, color website, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, so one thing I think that you are have always been known for is staying on top of techno- technology to enable communications and public relations. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think it's true to this day that people better stay on top of it. Because that's where where it's at, and uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, I think it's easier today. I think technology has made it the marketing people's job much easier. You don't have to go on the road in a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to process ninety seven rolls of film, and you know, in a, in a hurry. And, you know, time is. You know, that's in news. That was the other thing with, is that that nobody likes yesterday's news. So if if you weren't Delivering those things, and, and and sending the photos and stories, and you wait a day or two and put it in the mail, it's not gonna run. You know, right. it's hard enough to get it run anyways. So, right. but but technology is 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 a marketing marketeer's friend, and I'm obviously a PR friend. Exactly, and I I still you know in my agency to this day have always said we've got to stay on top of this. We've got to <laughs> you know, and now with yeah. social media, we got to stay on top of this. We can't. Mm-hmm. Just rest on our laurels and yeah. do it's, what we did yesterday. It's interesting about social media because, in 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 my roles later in, in life, um, it, it's everybody was trying to put social media under PR, and I was never a believer in that. Okay, I thought social media belonged under the marketing as as a subset and not the PR. PR uses social media. There's absolutely no question. It's a great vehicle for it. But um, what we could do with social as far as the information that we could get on our customers and our guests and who are the lookalikes, okay? And, you know, we, we have a set of data points on our people and how you can run those data points to find other people just like the people you already have. I mean, to me, that's what makes marketing so much easier today and and quite frankly you know when i was retiring you know from actually you know full-time job you know, we were we'd let the computers place everything you didn't have to make a decision all i have to do is make sure i had the knew the profile that we were looking for and then we'd go find those people very targeted very specific would we change the profiles at time absolutely for certain situations, but um, and we didn't have to make a decision. We didn't have to say, "Oh, we're going to put it on Pandora." Or is it going to go on? You know, they'd even put it on still the, some of the more traditional media, television, radio, and newspaper. But mostly, they'd be online, very targeted, and you get results, and you can analyze it. Oh yeah, it's like a constant research program like a ongoing focus group oh, yeah. and i think so many people miss that they don't pay any attention to their google analytics they're like oh yeah our web company does that it's like oh yeah, yeah. it's telling you <laughs> so much oh yeah 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 yeah. i mean i mean i would let the agencies dig most of that because i mean i and i i didn't have the time to do it but i i, I knew i knew what to be looking for that's for sure and probably that's because of my technical background when I was in school. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you you you've got a curious mind too and I don't think your mind ever really rests. <laughs> Therefore, I know that as long as I was working for you, I didn't rest either. <laughs> I was reminiscing today about when I had my son Craig who's turning 27 and I think I was in labor in the hospital, <laughs> and I was on the phone with you. Oh, we got to get one more thing done, one more thing before that baby comes. <laughs> you, Nancy, you're going to paint me as a bad guy, <laughs> a driver. No, no, I I went along with it because, and I, you know, I I learned from you. I'm like that now. Well, so you know, to the to that point, um, when when I joined Jackson Hole Mountain Resort as their CMO. Um, it was just when people were accepting social media. People hadn't really jumped into it wholeheartedly at the corporate level because they were afraid of it. Okay, you know the leaders, the other executives on the team and stuff were really afraid of it and thought it would hurt us, and they really didn't understand it. And 
in reality, um, it, and then they say, "Oh, you're going to save money." Oh, you don't. Uh, and then they started getting interest a little bit more. And uh, but the thing was, at the end, I said, "I need more staff because we have to. If if you're going to do good social programs, you got to be there all the time. And in, in, a, in a place like Jackson Hole." You know who you're going after. You have to produce content. And producing content, you know, that programming is very labor intense. And you can't just do it sporadically, you know. In our case, you got to do it consistently, constantly, and at a high level to be effective. And, and that means at the end of the year, my first year there, people – crawl out in April, the season was over, and crawl out of my offices just totally exhausted because it wasn't, in the old days, you know, we'd buy a whole bunch of ads and, and, and magazines and a couple of ski sections and newspapers, major newspapers. We'd put our feet up on the desk. We'd, you know, eat crumpets and drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> believe that. <laughs> and, 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 and wait for the people to come. Right, yeah. You know, and, and uh, that's not the way it is with social. You 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 need to, and, and it's a mistake a lot of companies make that I see, and especially early on in the ski industries, people would not staff up that side of their marketing arm, okay, to 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 allow you to do quality content, and quality content will eventually turn into business at some point in time. Yeah, absolutely. And it built obviously the best way to build your brand. Well, yeah, and that's another thing I would like to talk about is the whole Sugarloaf brand. Of course, I know you've worked at several other resorts since then, but in my mind now, a, a brand implies a brand promise and a brand network of you know rave, raving fans. And I think you were very instrumental in building that Sugarloaf brand. And and the, I feel like Sugarloafers they bleed Sugarloaf blue. Like Sugarloaf is part of their DNA. Yeah, yeah. And that was something that you really kind of carved out. Well, yeah, I was, I mean, I, I would say I was lucky because there was a lot of really good work done before I got there. Was, and, and the thing is they hadn't really pulled it together. They were there and, and, and the basis for it and a very loyal following of people. Um, but we had such great people who were our, our skiers there, you know, from Maine. And we really wanted to be a Maine, we wanted Maine to be a big part of what we, who we are and what we were, and still are. Um, and in reality, Boyne even took it to another level by dropping the USA and saying, you know, we, we don't even want to confuse the brand with the USA part of it. Um, so, uh, and we were able just to build on the character of of the, of the main person, the citizen. In reality, you know, hard workers, charging. Like you know, they don't give up easy, and and Sugarloaf is a place where you can't give up easy. You know, it can be cold up there in January, you know, yeah. and and it can be dark and face north, but they charge, they charge, and they get you know get just to get the march, you oh, know, you're right. and, and those and the snowfield. So it's it's a very strong commitment to the sport, no matter what level they're at. And of course, we used a lot of people early on. Just as, as I when I was leaving, you know, taking key high-profile people um, in Maine and, and putting them on television and let them, let them tell their struggle story, which helped build that brand. And I just love that. I, I, well, you know, again, the whole storytelling idea and the human interest story. And, mm -hmm. and uh, It was a different problem with Jackson, Jackson Hole when I got there. Because, you know, when you think of Jackson Hole, what do you think of? I think of badass skiing. <laughs> yeah. Big mountain. Yes. Um, and, you know. Cowboys. Cowboys, but expert skiers. Yeah. I mean, expert skiing. Right. And they sold, that's all they sold themselves to. And unfortunately, and, and they felt that was their brand. And that, that's the only thing they could be. And um, unfortunately for them, you take a very small sliver of the population already, only 2.5% two, two of the people in the United States ski. So if you, if you think that's a, that is a sliver, and so targeting really means something when you talk to those people when you need, in our industry. But when you, when you uh, think that you carve 2.5% down to experts, true experts, that like, and the, for the train that we have, then you're, you're looking 
to draw from a very small pool of skiers and snowboarders. And when I got there, the first thing I tried to do was figure out how to blew them up, blew the mountain. And, uh, and for and, non-skiers, and, that's make it more intermediate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, that, and that was my job. And, and I had people at the company at the senior level tell me I was going to ruin the brand of Jackson because I was trying to blue the mountain and everything like that. But the thing is, we, we, we were able to shift the brand enough without losing – the essence. The, the essence of being an expert mountain. And now to invite a whole other group of people up there and say, you know, we've just redid this whole area up there with bulldozers and new lifts and all things like that. And we came up with a program all we said was all new, all blue. Oh, yeah. And it's a totally intermediate part of a mountain. And what do you think happened? Ski of visits jumped about 70,000 one year. Oh, yeah. And probably those people you would brag at the water cooler when they got back. That Absolutely. They had skied there and <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, implied that they were among the experts. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then people really felt good about themselves. Yeah. Which is very important that your product does that. Oh, exactly. And it's not take them there and beat them up. I mean, we had to invest in more groomers. We had to do all the things that blueing the mountain meant okay for people who aren't skiers you know we had to take places that they never groomed before steeper terrain that was that they didn't feel like they wanted to groom because you had to have very advanced grooming equipment and and go out and groom and and blew the place there was plenty of the other stuff plenty of cliffs plenty of bumps plenty of shoots Right, you know that. that, that, that. <laughs> Tread the gnar. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyways, that was a different problem than Sugarloaf's problem. Right. Exactly. You know, you know Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf's just a, a a main place. Well, I'd love to talk about the Sugarloaf versus Sunday River oh, right. <laughs> battle, and I also want to talk about Paul Schiffer and how that was kind of my first experience with personal branding. But first, I think we're going to take a little break, and we're going to hear about the Marshall Plan. I don't know if you've heard about the Marshall Plan. Of but... course. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be back with more from Chip Carey in just a moment. This podcast is all about growing your network in order to strengthen your brand. In my 30-plus year marketing and PR career, I have seen many organizations waste their precious time and money on marketing because they're trying to obtain success without any strategy to achieve their goals. So many organizations and companies suffer from what I call the shiny object syndrome, trying every new fad that comes down the pike. That's why I created the Marshall Plan 15 years ago. We have done over 100 of these plans for clients, helping them to get out of their day-to-day routine to identify their goals, solidify their brand story, focus in on their ideal customer avatar, analyze their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and create a realistic budget and measurement dashboard. We create the Marshall Plan collaboratively with our clients over the course of three months. We have a 65-step process to create a highly customized, actionable plan. And it's not like we come in and say, we are the consultants from away and we know everything. Instead, we come in and say, let's sit down at the table with your leadership team And we'll bring our expertise in what's working in PR and marketing. And our client team brings their knowledge of what's working in their organization. And together, we come up with a really amazing plan. For many, it's been a transformative process. I have watched how teams have come together and their faces light up because they have such a sense of accomplishment and they're so excited about the future of their organization. We help our client figure out the best way to implement the plan, sometimes using people within their organization and sometimes with our help. We would love to chat with you about how you can expand your network and achieve your marketing goals with a Marshall Plan. Go to marshallpr.com slash marshallplan to learn more about the process, or better yet, send me an email at nancy at prmaven.com, and we'll set up a time to talk and get started. And now back to our conversation. (laughs) 
Okay, well, we're back with Chip Carey. And for me, this is like very nostalgic because I started working for Chip in 1984, November of, of 1984. And I had worked in PR for a few years, but it was really like going to school every day to work for Chip. <laughs> and of course, if you know me, I also have a strong personality, so I probably was not the easiest employee. Like, I think at a certain point it was decided that I would be better off like just having my own business <laughs> in 1991. But throughout the 80s, I did uh, learn a lot from Chip. And one of the big lessons was when Sugarloaf and Sunday River went to war against each other about, because Sh- Sunday River was always trying to convince people that Sugarloaf was so far. So how did you counteract that, Chip? Boy, we're, <laughs> we're going back to the days of marketing wars. And, yeah. and you know, with the kind of where we've gone with our conversation so far today, it's, it's like, to me, of course, I'm now old, right? Uh, and it, it, we, I felt, I felt like I was, I came through the golden age of marketing, okay, and because it was exciting, everything was changing so much, so fast all the time, from you know, from fax machines to driving your car, you know, shooting on 16 millimeter. The TV stations were still using 16 millimeter film, okay, not even video, you know, uh, you know, the start of cable television. You know, up there with WSKI and stuff like that. Yeah, you but, started that. Yeah, and then I'll, and then you had this area in New Remain that was uh, upshot, coming up really fast under a good ownership and a, a very uh, um, aggressive Com- competitive. management. <laughs> competitive, <laughs> which was awesome. But it also, you know, at times we kind of had to try to push them you know, try to put them back in their place, if you will. You know, at least that's the way we looked at it. You know, I mean, they're an awesome place. You know, they got, you know, six different mountain places, that, you know, up uh, lift areas that they can go to. And it provides an incredible product. But, you know, we were, had been always just number one ourselves. And we didn't want somebody new coming in and stomping on our territory. But, you know, again, they're, they're, they, Les was very aggressive. He's a marketeer himself. Les Otten. Right? And uh, so we, we, we felt like, you know, we need to try to stay on top of them, if you will, our competitors. And we would count cars. I mean, I think that's something people didn't know. Like we, people, we would send somebody from Sugarloaf down to Sunday River to walk through or drive yeah. through and count where the license places are. License yeah. Are from. Oh yeah, and then there was car counts going on simultaneously at Sugarloaf. Yeah, and at Killington too. You know, mm-hmm. and, and but and, and the thing is, we didn't just count the cars and know how many cars are there. We were counting the cars, and all of a sudden, if we saw uh, a, I mean, this is grassroots again, know. knowing your customer, guerrilla or knowing, marketing, and find it, knowing your enemy, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or a good competitor, was where were the people coming from? Okay, all of a sudden, if you go down there and you see an unusual amount of Connecticut cars in the parking lot. Did we as marketeers miss something? Okay, and that's the only way you could really tell sometimes was that it was that way. But we could also follow the growth and things like that. But Sunday River loved to tell us that we were way out in the boonies. And, you know, quite frankly, Sugarloaf is off the beaten path. And that's one of the things that makes it a very special place in Carabasa Valley. And um, there's no question that, that that's part of Sugarloaf's brand in itself. Uh, but... So we, we needed to counter somehow that Sunday River was closer to Boston. They were making huge strides in the Boston market and eroding some of our business from, from, um, from that region, you know, especially north of Boston. And um, so I decided I got to figure out just how far away, much farther away we are. And so I hopped in my car and uh, I went down and, and, and drove from – Sunday River down to Portland, and they had always said 75 miles, right? And then I went over and drove from Portland to Sugarloaf, and uh, I got that number in my head, and I says, okay, we're only 35 miles further, okay, which isn't very much, and, you know, and then uh, we went back and forth, and Attorney General got involved in the state of Maine, and they came out, and, you know, they were trying to make us stop using the campaign, but 
we go to the ski show in Boston, you know, we were playing out only 35 miles further and, 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 and things were in the media and the Boston, and now we're making the Boston Globe, right, with our wars and going at each other. They loved uh, it, right? Uh, oh, the yeah. media? Oh, the media <laughs> loved it for sure. I mean, I pulled the Regina's Pizza in the North End to pick up a pizza to drive home at night, right? And I had my Sugarloaf car outside. I was just kind of double parked and ran in. I had ordered it. And there, there's, there's a bar that sits right there. And I went in and he goes, people were going, I really only 30 35 miles farther because they had seen the logos on my car. So you know the program was working, okay? Uh, but it was so much fun. Everybody got into it, too. You know, the soccer teams, the CVA, when they go off and play, and then they got into the tournament, and they had to play, uh, you know, the um, – Gould. Gould Academy, you know, and, and so we, we had people running across the field with 35 miles, you know, and, and we didn't do it. I mean, we didn't we didn't ask these that kids to do that, and yeah. a couple of kids wore shirts out with this stuff. I mean, it, 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 it was fun, and, and in those days, you know, it, part of these marketing was, it wasn't all just about the 35 miles, but we get up every single day and try to think what we could do to be better with our marketing so we could, quote, outdo, if you will, our competitor down the street. And uh, that really dr it drove me. It was so much fun to come in every day and figure out what are we going to do now. And uh, kind of a, a funny story somebody reminded me of. At a, we were at a, at a uh, board of directors meeting of a, of a client that I did some consulting with. And uh, one of the people uh, uh, in the audience said, hey, Chip. And I was, I was speaking to the group, and they said, hey, Chip, tell them uh, the story about how you used to figure out how much snow you had at Sugarloaf versus Sunday River. And I said, I can't tell that story. You tell the story. And so the story went that uh, the question, how, how would I determine how much snow we got? On, on Sugarloaf, I, I'd, I'd say, I'd pick up the phone and call Sunday River and add eight inches. <laughs> <laughs> because it, got, it, it felt like it was getting unreasonable. So I was trying to make them stretch to an area that was um, well out of their range of them to have that much snow. At the expense of me being out of the range of us having that much snow, so that they 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 had to back down on their aggressiveness on the number of inches of snows I got by me saying I was eight inches more, and they they couldn't keep adding to. They're already we're, we're probably all exaggerating in those days, but uh, I actually don't believe that that we were exaggerating. But uh, anyways, in that case, we decided to use something against it. But the wars it not only happened here, but you know, like Killington, Sunday River, and then got in the battles with Killington. Uh, we got into small battles with Killington and Vermont, but we were really focused our stuff on on our key market, which was Maine and and, uh, and Boston, and and that's why it was that thirty five mile now thirty five miles further. Yeah, and, and, and that was a PR campaign. I mean, there was hardly any paid advertising. Oh no, no, it. no paid advertising. Yeah. It was all 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 PR. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just we rode so much, and we got so much out of that. It was unbelievable. Right, and Skip King was the communications director there, and of course he got totally. <laughs> <laughs> they hired engineers, it. you know. Oh no, they, I didn't. They, know. they hired engineers that come up, okay, and so oh. they, you know, I I said thirty five miles further, okay, in their yeah. in their paperwork they said they're all of them literature everything seventy five miles from Portland, right, okay. Me being an engin background in engineering, the distance between two points are the edges, right? Right. Okay, if you had two squares laying on the floor, you want to know how far they yeah. were apart, right. you'd, you'd measure from edge to edge. Right. And so I went up the, um, the, the exit, in, um, I think it was Washington Avenue in Portland. Right. Is that? And, yeah. and I started my clock there. Right. And, and then I went to Sugarloaf, and when you turned onto the cactus, uh, uh, access, access road. road, we hit the clock again. Right. And so these inches, so I, that's how I came up with 35 miles difference. Right. I used their 75 and I used what I got. And so they hired these engineers and, you know, everything's, you know, everybody all of a sudden starts to get away from you. Is this thing gets hot and you got the attorney general in it and, you know, they're going to try to make us cease and cease and all this other stuff. <laughs> and, and so I'm sitting in my office knowing this day they were going to measure the distance. Okay. So the guys, the engineers come into my <laughs> into my office and I'm just sitting there by myself because nobody would be in a hundred feet of me because I was poison at the time <laughs> and he comes in and the guy goes 110.1 miles and all I had to be was 110 oh gosh and 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we continued the program. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Warren, who you were working for at the time, he loved it too because he's a Marine. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <and> military execution. <laughs> once it would be, once we could really defend the position, he liked it. Yeah, right. <laughs> they exactly. were all they were all away from me now. Yeah, right. I was they online yeah, by right. myself. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, then at a certain point, Sunday River bought. Sugarloaf. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there was a sign on the spillway chair that said, that about halfway up the mountain, that said, if you were at Sunday River, you'd be at the top now. Yeah, that's double running, not spillway. Oh, that was okay. on, <laughs> it was on yeah, low okay. and narrow gauge, yeah, okay? Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when Sunday River all of a sudden bought Sugarloaf, Warren Cook presented that sign to Les Otten on his knees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Warren goes, Chef, what, what should we do? I says, well, take down that sign and bring it to him. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that sign exists anywhere. Uh, Probably I, bet, less, I bet it does. Les has it somewhere. <laughs> should, should be in the main ski hall, hall of fame. Yeah, or it should. Museum. It should. And speaking of which, that's a good segue. Um, Paul Shipper is going to be inducted nice. into the main ski hall of fame this October. And of course, um, you know, when I started working for you in the 80s, Paul had just started his skiing streak. We were calling him the Cal Ripken of skiing because. He never missed a day. Well, I think when I started, he had gone about two or three seasons. And you were like, you know, you used to call me Briggs because yeah. uh, that's my maiden name. And I think Briggs represents the certain uh, part of me. that <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what part. But anyway, uh, so, yeah, so you were like, Briggs, we got to do this PR campaign around this guy, Paul Shipper. And, of course, I knew Paul because I had stayed at the Lumberjack Lodge, which he owned when I first moved up to the mountain. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But it, now, as I look back, that was my first experience with what I would call now personal branding, which was telling a person's story in order to communicate the story of a company or a destination. Well, he had a story to tell, you know, and he had he he had no way to tell it. I mean, he, he, or he didn't have the means to tell it. Okay, and he wasn't really. I don't think he was really interested in telling the stories, other than around his buddies, his immediate circle of friends, very close. In, okay um and again you know i always look at things as opportunities you know we, we in marketing we need ways to, to to get into the news and to to uh and pr produce something that people were interested in and of course we had cal ripkin who was running how I many baseball whatever his streak was you know and he had paul had been and he was skiing more than just struggle in those days right he would hop in a plane and go to you know out west, and and I can't remember where if he went. I don't think he went to Mammoth, but I think he went to someplace in Washington, and he would ski there. So his days, he would get his days up. I think one year he skied every single day of the year. But but Paul had, Paul had a story that needed to be told, and being an opportunist and right. seeing good content, uh, we we blew it up. I mean, if that had been during the days of social media, okay, because we're talking back in the mid nineties, right, um, and well, his, it would have really gone viral right, for sure. Yeah. So his story was he had been a, an airline pilot for, I think, American Airlines. And he had a crash and the strut went into his heart, collapsed his heart. And the airline forced him to retire. But he really didn't feel he had to retire. He didn't want to retire. But they forced him to. So he moved to Sugarloaf, bought the Leverjack Lodge. And he was going to show them that, you know, he could ski every day. So inferring that he also could fly but he wasn't flying so yeah and and it it built and built momentum to the point where kind of like the 35 miles more story anywhere paul went he was a celebrity and people were asking for him for his autograph and i have a picture was, taken with him and oh, yeah. yeah but i mean we started i mean i always think of concentric circles we started the pr very local with the Irregular, the mm -hmm. local paper in Kingfield, Maine, and then the Waterville Sentinel, and then the Portland Press Herald, and then the Boston Globe, and then eventually we were able to get it into People Magazine twice. Mm -hmm. And Good Morning America sent a crew up. And again, your visual line, you know, we 
brought in the high school marching band from Mount Abram <laughs> High School. <laughs> and I think we, you know, we had balloons and, you know, we would have a parade, again, to make it very visual, to escort Paul down yeah. on every 100 days. We had a ceremony of some kind. So, I mean, being part of that for me just became, you know, such an important part of my career and my life. Well, you think skiers, it's, it's almost like the, the the surfing movie Endless Summer, right? This, this, you know, skiers want to, would love to think they could want, well, they all want to ski every single day, you know, and Paul epitomized that, right? Right. And, and he was doing it and people were living their dreams through Paul, at the time, and, and very smart editors picked up on the fact that this is a story that a lot of people would love to be experiencing themselves. You know, and, and he had to make a lot of sacrifices, like when lot. his son graduated from the Culinary Institute of America, which is all the way down in Poughkeepsie, New York. He skied under the headlights of a grooving machine at midnight. Yeah, and then he got in his. His uh, vehicle drove down to Poughkeepsie to go to the ceremony, and then he drove right back so he wouldn't miss a day of skiing. Yeah, and yeah. When, when he used to go other places and ski and not miss a day, he'd do the same thing. He did that several times and with the cat lights going down. Yeah, and snow. he skied. He had pneumonia. I mean, it's seven, once he had double pneumonia, I think, and he would still drag himself yeah. up there. Um, you know, he'd drive up with, wearing his ski boots, which eventually then his vision wasn't so good, and he was driving up in his ski boots, and people would clear off the access road when they knew he was coming. Well, it came to a time when we really needed to tell Paul he could let it go. Right. So, again, yeah, you know, we, you and I, made a PR opportunity out of that. I think that was yeah. when you had moved I was out. Where, I was out. Yeah, west, you yeah. had you had gone to the canyons, yeah. and there was a young man, Gregory Warner, who was a stringer for NPR, and we actually <laughs> <laughs> so typical. I learned from you. We made it into a PR opportunity where we had a conversation on the phone between you and Paul, but we made it into a radio story. Yeah, um, and basically, Paul needed you to kind of give him permission to stop the streak. Paul felt. Or an, an obligation at that point to keep the streak going because it was so good for PR for Sugarloaf and and he enjoyed I think the notoriety yeah, yeah. but it also did help get the word out about Sugarloaf so oh, yeah, yeah. I I hope we can find uh, an audio clip somewhere of that conversation because I be remember awesome. I remember yeah. it quite you know and it was very um, emotional. I mean, I think you, we were all uh, kind of on on the cusp of crying. Yeah, you know, like Paul, you can stop. You've done your duty. Uh, and, and I remember telling him the story of my swimming. That I swam every single day for fourteen years between right. Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend on Hancock okay. Pond. And yeah, and and finally, I moved out west. Became, and I moved to a high desert, <laughs> and. I, it was getting much more difficult. And I finally had to say to myself, I mean, I was driving myself crazy trying to find a place to swim. And finally, I just said, you know, you got to let it go. And and I, I mean, I had to tell that story to Paul to help him understand that, you know, probably nobody's going to beat you, Mark, at least nobody from Maine, more than likely, maybe someplace in the world, but uh, that it's easy to let it go. It's run its course, and you're a Cal Rifkin of... Skiing, yeah. You know, and God bless him. When when Paul passed, um, I think I wrote his his obituary for the New York Times, and it did it did run. It was like a full half page in the New York Times, and I looked up at the sky when that came out and said, "Oh, Paul, you know, yeah. you would have loved <laughs> seeing this," because I mean, it did take such great effort for him to do what he did, and then to see the story reported. And again, he knew it was benefiting Sugarloaf, so it wasn't really about him. Right. Or his, it wasn't egotistical at all. It was really for the greater good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So um, anyway, I enjoy now working uh, with individuals doing what I call personal branding now. Mm. I actually have a certification in it. But really, I hadn't thought about this until a year ago or so that 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 whole Paul Schiffer experience, which ran, uh, you know, probably a, a good 10 or more years. I mean, I'm not sure how many years he actually. It was longer than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah, yeah. I, I was involved with it for oh, at yeah. least 10 years, yeah, and yeah. it was just a great run. And um, 
And I'm very happy now that Paul will be inducted into the Ski Hall of Fame. And I'm just sad that he's not going yeah, to be there. To, yeah, yeah, I agree. But his son, Jeff, and uh, Jeff's wife, Lori, will be there. And I right. think Kibby, his daughter, is oh, coming good. for that also. So that will be a great celebration. Mm-hmm. And a, a lot of us uh, you know, who worked at Sugarloaf at the time are going to get together. You should come for that. That's in October. <laughs> I'll be uh, high on a mountain in uh, <laughs> Bulgaria. Oh, wow. Going Hiking um, hut to hut Good in for October. you. Yeah. So that's another thing that I have always admired about you, Chip, is I, I remember if you went on a business trip, you would even just stop along the road somewhere and put on your running clothes and go for a run. So you've always made time for that yeah. exercise. and It's important. Yeah. Because mental health, physical health helps you do your job better. Yeah, it does. You know, it gives and, you the energy to do it. And gives health and happiness. And happiness. Right. Comes with, with it, for sure. And we've always <laughs> we've always been good at that. We've always had a lot of good laughs, you and for I. Sure, yeah. <laughs> we throw big parties, too, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I remember when we, we went out on New York Harbor and we were able to, uh, you, you let me be the hostess and we had a yacht and we invited all the ski riders and oh, yeah. we had cocktails. <laughs> And it was very fancy. I loved that. <laughs> and then I think I slept on the couch <laughs> in the hotel room or something. Yeah, I know. I know. We, yeah, yeah, we did usually save money on lodging. Um, <laughs> I always had to find somebody I could stay with who I knew. Uh, then I also remember at Two Park Avenue, which was where ski and skiing were located. One time mm. we went there. We didn't have any appointment or anything. So you told me just to Briggs, go in the ladies' room and just wash your hands and see if you can run into any reporters or editors or anything. So I was like washing my hands for like a long time, and then a reporter came in. I'm like, "Hi, I'm Nancy from Sugarloaf. Have you been to Sugarloaf?" <laughs> and that's what I call guerrilla PR. <laughs> yeah, that's at least grassroots. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And then the other thing I just wanted, before we wrap up, I wanted to talk about special events. You know, special events are a great way to bring people together under your brand umbrella. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of events at Sugarloaf that you started. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Reggae Weekend being uh, one of the most no- no- notorious events. Yeah, that's been going on now for over 30 years. And you started the- as a way to extend the ski season. That's correct. Well, you know, again, you have events, and you can build something around events. Okay, you you get the you get the PR, you get the stories in the papers, things like that, and you get in in the case of of reggae, the, your your clients, your your guest gets to enjoy something that's pretty special. Um, but it, and and you never know where it's going to come from, right? I mean, I had an event in April that was a big event, and. We had had some issues with snow for a couple of years, and my sponsors have been at me saying, ah, well, I want to go into winter when we can shore of good conditions, winter. And I, I says, no, it's normally so great the first weekend in, in April. you got to stay with me. And then we had the flood of 87 on April Fool Day, okay? And my sponsors for that event, which was, was for the Dana Fiber Cancer Institute, you know, we raised a couple million dollars for cancer research. So they said, we're we're you're either going to move it into the winter or we're going to stop sponsoring this thing. So we moved them into January. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now I had a vacant spot. And so I, I, I looked around, and this is, it goes to show you you don't have to really know a lot about what you're talking about. <laughs> but but uh, I happened to notice in the summer that there were – Around, the, around New England, there had been a bunch of reggae fests going on in the summertime. And I says, well, we could do that in wintertime, in the spring, because we're trying to say how warm and sunny, you know, awesome spring, fabulous spring skiing, you know, and whatever, you know, warm, sunny. So I, was, I went with reggae, and I started an event called Reggae, and I didn't even know what dreadlocks were. <laughs> okay? I mean, literally. So you don't have to know all the T's, you know, you have to, you just... But you start an event that you see that has a little momentum in the marketplace already and it's still going on. You know, that was 88 was the first one. And now, isn't it the biggest weekend of the whole year? And a lot of non skiers go just for the yeah. music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it fills up all the lodging and um, it's 
it's a good time. You know, it's a fun, good spring event, which, you know, Sugarloaf is, more, I think, more famous for a spring skiing than, than it's midwinter skiing. King of yeah. spring. King of spring. <laughs> Snow feels. That's you right. Know? And so, I, I, I'm, you know, that's one of the ones I'm proud of, starting, because the legacy is still going. It's kind of like the Sugarloaf Marathon still going. Right. Right. You know, I started that in 1984, 83, excuse me. Uh, and uh, still going on today. Both of those events bring in a whole audience that doesn't even ski. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people um, from the Augusta area, from the YMCA, where I do my spinning classes, and they are they all go up at, to Sugarloaf. They look forward to staying in the condo for the weekend. And, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. So that's a great thing. And then, of course, uh, the heavyweight ski championships. <laughs> we should puka, just... Puka, <laughs> puka. <laughs> I should tell our listeners, puka, puka for Chip and I is like our code for, for food and eating. And <laughs> eating too much. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> My word. <laughs> <laughs> That's always been the reason to exercise. I think Chip does it more than I do, but exercise so you can eat more. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this has been a great conversation, Chip. I think we could go all day, and we, we maybe will have to have another episode to cover all the other. I frequently you know, tell my employees now, like, Oh, this is another Chip Carey lesson. And I think some of them roll their eyes like, oh, boy, here we go again. (laughs) But no, I mean, things like staying on top of technology and building relationships and making it visual and telling the story. I mean, there's so many Mm -hmm. PR 101 or maybe it's actually 404 because it's like advanced PR. But that's 101. If you think about it, it's the basics. But using having new tools to use to do the basics. Right, and also, but staying on top of those tools yeah. and, oh, yeah, and not being afraid. I mean, for me, even just like this podcast has been such a great way to open up a whole new avenue for me, and I'm having so much fun with it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I always say you have to be a student of the game. You know, if you if you're not studying and staying on top of it, you don't have to be the first one necessarily, but you got to see what's going on and start. You know, you hear the. You hear a little sound bites about certain things, and you you start researching and looking into it, and let you know it's okay to let some other people make some mistakes early on. That's the first or last cup of coffee theory, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Chick would always <laughs> say, uh, "Nobody wants the first <laughs> cup of coffee or the last cup of coffee in the pot." <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, it's it's important to stay on. You know, be a student of the game, and and one of the things I think right now is, you know. In my age is where I'm starting to let go, being the student of the game. I, you know, I have other things that I'm trying to accomplish now. So I'm, I don't think that right now I'm staying on top of the, as much as I was when I was younger. But you're the best grandpa in the world, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, you have Camp Carry, which where the adventure never ends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every day an adventure. Every day an adventure. You even have a tagline, yep. and and yeah. you have how many grandchildren now? We have. Uh, seven right now, and eighth one coming uh, in November. Well, I'd say those are pretty lucky kids. <laughs> well, you know, if you think about a career, you know, in myself, I you know, I got out of college, I went skiing. Okay, literally went skiing the day I got out of college, and uh, um, my whole family now, I have three kids, myself and my wife, and we. They're all in the ski industry one way or another, okay? Bryn owns a very successful company called Ski Butlers. Uh, Forrest is a U.S. ski team coach, and Rebecca is raising ski races at Jackson Hole with her husband, and she is able to stay home, luckily, and and get her kids in, into the race. So they're all the grandkids are racing. Every grandkid, by the time they're two, are skiing. And so, you know, what I did for work is has been penetrated down into my kids and they all just love skiing and as far as i'm concerned it's one of the greatest um sports family sports there is because you can do it way well into your old age you know and like paul shipper did yeah well i agree absolutely and as the mother now of two ski coaches myself yeah <laughs> i feel the same way and i think that you were always a role model for me so i appreciate that yeah, thank you. of course i remember helping take care of <laughs> forrest and Bryn. <laughs> <laughs> that was part of my 
responsibility when I worked there is to helping to take care of the kids, especially the time that Bryn put the hairbrush down the, <laughs> the toilet when he, we had to have the toilet taken apart by a plumber. <laughs> but now he's a very successful entrepreneur, hey, I know. Yeah, he is. And he's a dad himself, which mm-hmm. is really, really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, Chip, thank you. And thank you. Uh, I know that our listeners in PR Maven Nation are going to enjoy hearing uh, about our stories, but hopefully learning about, you know, some of these PR, you know, no matter where you are in history, that it all boils down to relationships, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I agree. Thank you, Nancy. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, PR Maven Nation, and we'll see you on the flip side. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank you for listening, and if you feel that you've gotten value out of today's conversation, consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes or whatever app you're using to tune in. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so. I release a new episode each week, and subscribing will make sure you get an alert when there's a new episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation by going to prmaven.com slash nation and clicking join. It's free and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you have an Alexa-enabled device, be sure to add the PR Maven Marketing Minute to your daily flash briefing menu. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.